How many years was Jesus in the how many days was Jesus in the wilderness? 40, 40 days. 40 days, right? You guys with me? At the back? You guys pay attention, right? Yeah. How many days was Jesus in the wilderness? 40 days. Okay, and then what happened after that 40 days? The devil tempted him. The devil came and the devil tempted him. Uh-huh. And what did the devil use when he tempted him? The he used a sword. He used a scripture. So now the devil is coming with him. Man shall and he said turn the stones into, into, into bread. And Jesus said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. What did Jesus do? He quoted from the scripture. He used his sword. So now the devil came at him. And he said, it is what? It is what? Written. I'm not hearing anybody. It is what? Written. It is written. So now Christ, if we, are, if we call ourselves Christians, Christ like a followers of Christ, shouldn't we be doing the same thing that Christ did when he was on this earth? So now, when the devil comes at us, we say, it is written, man shall live by bread alone. Whatever it is, wherefore shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word of God. So now we see this here, that we need our sword to fight this battle. And let's go to Jeremiah 6 verse 16. And when you have it, say amen. Okay, you guys don't have it yet. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and read first. So now we see here it says ask for the old ways and then call it the what the good way the good path that, and then some people say that we will not walk therein so now what is it saying here is that sometimes the old things which was established was established directly from God and God has laid down a foundation for his church and this is why we are doing what we call tracing the old paths so we are studying our past history so that way, we can study what was the good way, because what was established back then is a firm foundation. What did I say? It was a what? A firm foundation. So God established a firm foundation in the beginning, and He wants us to walk in that way, which was established in the beginning, by Christ Himself. You guys with me so far, right? You guys are awake, right? You guys think that you're sleeping. No? If you're awake, praise the Lord. If one of, if one of you guys are awake, I appreciate just one person. <laughs> All right, so as, as we're about to continue, let's have a, a word of prayer. Anybody who, can, who are able to kneel, you can kneel with me as we see God in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us there, O Lord, this evening, where we have come once again, O Lord, in this Sabbath day. And Lord, as we are about to partake of your word, as we are about to listen, Lord, about the great disappointment, I pray that you not only use me as a vessel, but to be you yourself speaking directly from here, O Lord, that if your people will not see me, but they will see you. Lord, forgive me for my sins, O Lord, cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and I pray that your, people, your children here will be ready and will be with a willing heart to receive what is about to be taught to God. Lord, keep us awake, keep us active, keep us to pay attention, help us to pay attention, O Lord. And Lord, and please, Lord, be in the midst of this place here this evening so that great things can happen. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so when we were talking last night, does anybody remember the last question that was asked? Did William Miller go out and preach? Did William Miller go out and preach? Who remember who William Miller was from last night when we spoke about? Anybody remember? William Miller is a pioneer. A pioneer, right? Yes. And he, what message did he, did he, did he find? Did he found the message of Jesus Christ. And then what was, he, what was he specifically talking about? He was talking about a prophecy. Which prophecy was he talking about? The 2300 day prophecy, right? So now, and then he said, 
and to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And then, when he was breaking down that prophecy, he, he, as she pointed out, for five years, he didn't say anything because he was afraid of leading other people into error because this was new to him. This is something new that he was learning. And he didn't want it to come here like I'm speaking here and teach false and teach anything that is false. You, we see that, right? So now let's, let's continue. Let's see what happened after that point where she left us off. So now we see here, along that time when we have here, you guys are paying attention, right? Those at the back, you guys are with me? At the back? At the back there? The young man? Everybody's with me, right? Okay. All right, so we see here, there was this man named um, William Miller, but there was also something that was going on was he was trying to break down the 2,000 French in prophecy. We have there in Matthew 24, it says there, there was supposed to be a great earthquake. Turn to 23 to Matthew 24, so we can see. So we can see from the scriptures, so I wouldn't be making up anything here. Everybody turn with me to Matthew 24. So Matthew 24. So now the, the man is asking Jesus in verse 3 at the end of and, and he says in verse 3, Matthew 24 verse 3, everyone is there, right? Amen. amen. When you have to say amen? amen. Who, who needs Bibles? Do we have any extra Bibles there? I see some of some of you have any extra Bibles there? Pass it Anybody wants a Bible? That's a French Bible. That's a French Bible? This one? Oh, yeah. Oh, who speaks French? <laughs> you speak French? You, you have a Bible already? No. Oh. <laughs> you, you want one? You want to teach this one? you be able to translate? Yes. Okay. Amen. Okay, so in Matthew 24, verse 3, everybody's there, right? Say amen. Amen. Okay, Matthew 24. Anybody in the hands, you can, you can share with each other. We are our brothers keepers, right? And he says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately and saying, Tell us, what shall these signs be? What shall, what shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? So now, the disciples are asking God, what will be the signs just before you come? Just before you break the clouds of heaven, what shall be the signs? Wouldn't you guys like to know that, right? You want to know exactly when Jesus is coming. So you will, they ask him, what shall be the signs? How can we know that your coming is near? And he said, tell us, when shall the signs be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. So the disciples are asking, what shall be the signs of the end of the world? And it starts off, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and he shall receive many. And he shall hear rumors of war, and see that he be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end is not yet. But let's go down to... Um, Let's go on to Okay, let's go down to verse 29. Verse 29. Let's look, let's look just before the coming of Christ. What events must take place? And it says, immediately after the tri tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. This is one here. The sun shall be what? Darkened. This is one sign that we will see before Jesus comes. And it says there, And the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Let's see if this thing actually happened. In, in 1755, 
It says, and the heaven shall be shaken, that's an earthquake shall take place. In 755, there was something called the great earthquake. We're not going to go in detail of every single one of them. But, and then the sun turned to darkness in the year 1780. 1780, the sun in midday, 12 noon, it was just dark like it was night. And this went on for a whole day. There was no light. That happened in 1780. So these are the signs which was coming. What, what year are we in now? 2013. So this was back then. It says the moon turned into blood. There was a point in history in 1780, that following day, that, that, that same day, the sun was red. The, the sorry, the moon was red as blood. And this was in what? 1780. But then the stars falling from heaven, as we see in Matthew 24 and verse 29. Let's go to the next slide. This is the one we want to concentrate on. Because this was about the same time that no, William and Miller was breaking down the prophecy of the 2300 days. And then we had this thing happen, this phenomenon happen in this same period of time. It says, the great star shower took place on the night of November 13, 1833. It was so bright that a newspaper could be read on the street. So in darkness, in you go like 12 noon in the night, you bring a newspaper, and you could have read, you could have seen the words in the newspaper. Because the stars, it says that it was so bright that the newspaper could be read on the street. One writer says for nearly four hours, listen, that's four hours, right? Four hours, the sky was literally ablaze. Men thought the end of the world had come. Look into this. It is most fascinating, and a sign of Christ's coming. Henry Danner Ward wrote thus for the wonderful phenomenon. No philosopher or scholar has told or recorded an event, I suppose, like that of yesterday morning. A prophet, 1800 years ago, foretold it exactly. That's in the Bible, in Matthew. We see here, and also it's found in Revelation, verse, verse 6, chapter 6. And it says there, and no philosopher or scholar has told or recorded an event, I suppose, like that of yesterday morning. A prophet 1800 years ago foretold it exactly. If we will be at the trouble of understanding stars to mean falling stars in, in the only sense, it which is possible to be literally true. So now, there was stars, you just see, you know, you have seen falling star, right? You also saw a falling star, right? You have seen it. But just imagine thousands of stars in the sky that's falling one after the other for four long hours. And what did Jesus say shall be the signs just before he come? He said that the stars shall fall from heaven. And this happened in 1833, just when William Miller was about to preach the first angel message or the 2300 day prophecy. We see that, right? So now we see here the Advent movement was growing because now people are saying, wait, this is the sign of Christ is coming. And everybody started looking up to William Miller because William Miller was preaching that Jesus will come in 1844. That's what that was his message. And now everybody was coming out to the Adventist church because now they saw this sign happen in Matthew 24. And they said, wait a minute, there's something huge happening there. All the events that were supposed to take place just before Christ is coming, we saw the last one fulfilled. So now let's go to the next slide. So now we had a man named Josiah Leach. One of the leading ministers preaching the second Advent message predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So during the time of William Miller, we had another man called Josiah Leach. And this man was preaching the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And he said that the Ottoman Empire would fall in their lifetime. They would see the fall in their lifetime. So now he printed in newspapers, he printed in, in an article predicting the fall before it even came. And let's see if that happened. So now Revelation 9, we're going to go to Revelation 9 right now, and it says, the prophecies of Revelation 9 in reference to the fifth trumpet are none other than that of Mohadism or Islam. There is a deep explanation of the symbols pointing towards such claims, but we will take the perspective of the prophetic time period as given. This, however, will in the same effect prove that it is in fact referring to Moadism in conjunction to the Ottoman Empire. So what we're saying right now is that we're not going to study every... You know the Bible is written in symbols. We're not going to study every single symbol from Revelation 9, but we're just going to study the time, the time prophecies. What did I say? The time prophecies. And then we will try to prove 
that is actually the Islam kingdom that he's talking about. We do not need to go and break down every single thing because we don't have time to do all of that. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now the first time period is, is found in Revelation 9 verse 5. Turn me to Revelation 9 verse 5. So you guys wouldn't say that I am making this up. Wait, Revelation 9 verse 5. Oh, I Go ahead and read it. Again. <laughs> and to them it was given. <laughs> and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion. When, yeah. when he took him, amen. So now we see here, how long was it that this was be tormented for? How long? For five months. Okay now, but before we establish that five months, let's... Now let's understand, let's understand Revelation. Let's understand the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was put into symbols, which is shown in letter to Revelation 1, verse 1. The book of Revelation is put into what? Symbols. Let's go to Revelation 1 verse 1 to prove that. How many of you guys have notebooks? No notebooks? We have one. Okay, so you guys have taken our notes? Alright, it's in, in your head, right? My brother says it's in his head. That, that's good. But if you have any questions, if you do not understand anything, whilst we went on through the study, just raise your hand. That's right, my brother. And tell me that I do not understand what you are saying, and I'll try to explain it to you all. Which part? Yeah. Which part is that? Everything. Everything? From the beginning? Okay. Well, we, from the beginning, we talk about Matthew 24. The starts one from heaven. The guy, Josiah Rich, from that point? Miller. Will William Miller? Yeah, that. Okay, we'll go to William Miller a little bit afterwards. We'll go back to him afterwards, in the future, as we, as we move on through the presentation. That's okay, right? Alright, so we'll go back to him. But let's go, let's look at Josiah Lich. So Revelation 1 verse 1. That's where we're going. Revelation 1 verse 1. What's the moon taking to them? What's the Read it, read it for me. Let me see. Correction. Matthew. Let me go back to you. I think I made up the error. Okay, I can't hear her question. She said that the, the moon will not give light. That's what you said, right? Okay, let's go to Matthew 24, 28. From 29, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. So we see here that the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give a light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's what you're talking about, right? The moon is to take blood. Okay, that, that's found in um, Revelation 6 gives us more information on that. Because I, the, 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 the one that I'm trying to bring out, let, 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 I, will, I will cover that one like afterwards, but let's go to the presentation. But the one I wanted to bring out was the start point from heaven, because that happened during the time when the admin was preaching the message. That's why I just mentioned the ones before, so we're not go deep, deep into it. But if, like afterwards, I have another presentation of that, and I can show you all, all the different signs, like what happened during the time. That's okay, you? Okay, so now, let's see here. It says here, Revelation 1 verse 1. And my brother's going to read it for me. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things, which must shortly come to pass. And he said, and sanctified, it by his angel unto his servant John. Okay, so now it says that the angel sent and what? And signified it. That word signified means to put in the symbols. 
And you, you, some of you guys have read Revelation, right? Before. And you see some things about dragons, you see something about heads, you see things about beasts and bears and all these things. And you guys thinking that this is literal. This, this is not literal. This is symbol. It represents something. So now let's, now we're going to approach Revelation with that kind of mentality. That everything that you see here is not to be taken literally. It's not to be taken what? So now it's everything that's put in the symbols. So now we need to break down what's the symbology of Revelation. But in Revelation, we need to understand that a day is equal to a year. A day is equal to what? A day is equal to a year. That's found in Numbers 14:34 and Ezekiel 4, 6. And a month in the Bible is equal to 30 days. How many days? And a year is equal to how many days? 360 days. So now when we're breaking our revelation, a day is equal to a year, the month is 30 days, and a year is 360 days. Is that clear so far? Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, it says five months. So now we establish that a month is equal to how many days? 30 days. So now if you have to find what five months is, you have to multiply it by 30. 100. That's right. That's a mathematician right there. 150 days. And then we have to take those days and a day is equal to what? A year. So 150 days will be equal to what? 150 years. So it says that in Revelation 9 that the kingdom would start with only rain or would have its power for 150 years. We see that, right? The Ottoman Empire, which is spoken of. Let's go to, let's go to the next slide. It says also, let's go to another time prophecy. So, so far, how many, how many years we have? 150 years. So now let's see what, what else. In, in um, verse 12 to 15, it gives more details to that after the 150 years. How many years after that? What will happen? It says, one war is past. So one war was for 150 years, and it says, and behold, three come, and there come two wars more after. So now two wars will come after. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And then we, when we go down to the bottom, it says, which will prepare for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. So now we see here, they give us some time. They say an hour, a day, a month, and a year. We see that, right? Let's go, to, let's, go, let's go and break that down. That hour, a day, a month, and a year. And it says an hour is like one quarter, one twenty-fourth of a, of a uh, day, right? One hour is one twenty-fourth, so that equals to fifteen days in a year. Because a day is equal to a year, right? So now we need to multiply a year by one hour, and that gives us fifteen days. So now we see here a day is equal to a year, a month is equal to thirty days, and a year is equal to three hundred and sixty days. So now when we add all of this together, it adds up to three hundred and ninety-one years and fifteen days. We see that, right? You understand it so far? So now, the total, when we take the 150 years, and we take 391 years, that will equal to 541 years and 15 days. So this is how long the Ottoman Empire was supposed to rule for. This is what Josiah Lich was saying, that this empire will rule for 441 years. Do you believe that they, they rule for that amount of time? He, he didn't only give the years, he gave a day. The day that the, the empire was supposed to fall, the exact day. You know some prophecies? I asked yesterday, we talked about a year. We talked about a year, but they give, give a day. And that's what's so great about this prophecy. Let's, let's go to see if it was fulfilled. Let's look for the start of it. So now, what the questions we need to ask was, what nation and when will they to begin the work? But by answering the second question, we will obviously answer the first question. So when will they to begin the work? Let's go to the next slide. So now we see here that Osman the first begins the invasion of Byzantine Empire in July 27th, 12, 1999. 
And we remember this Ottoman Empire was supposed to be was supposed to come from Islam or Moadism. You know, with Mohammed the leader, you know what Islam is, right? The Islamic power. So this kingdom was supposed to come from the Islam religion. So let's go to the next slide. So we see here, and they had a king over them. So they had one king over them, which is Apollyon, called the destroyer. Let's go to the next. But this king was to be an angel or the chief minister of the bottomless pit. That explains the bottomless pit. If we break down every single thing in Revelation 9, we understand that that is Mohammed. So he was supposed to arose under Mohammed. So now such was Othman. Othman was, that was the successor who had been such his successor, the successor, the successor of Mohammed. Because explain the bottomless pit is referring to the religion of Moadism and he was the successor of Muhammad. So, and he began his reign, his reign in 1299, July 27th. They, they, now we're looking at exact dates, right? The exact date, the exact month, the exact year. So in July 27th, 1299, 1299, 1299, I got it right. Okay, 1299, that's when he was supposed to start his reign. You guys with me so far, right? Yeah. Okay, now, it's how many years was it he supposed to be extended for? This Five. kid? 541 and 15 days. Now, let's see if it, if it came exactly. But the first wall was supposed to be for how long? 150 years. Let's see what happened after 150 years. So, five months, 150 years. So, now we have Constantine. He yields Benetton political independence. So Constantine gave up the, the independence of the Benetton. So that, that way they were subjected unto another kingdom. So actually they lost control of the kingdom after 150 years. Um, in 1499 AD. We see that, right? So 150 years, that's what's given to them so they, they can hurt the inhabitants of the earth. Let's go to the next slide. And it says, say to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are born in the great river Euphrates. So the four angels are the four principal nations of which the Ottoman Empire is composed. So that, that's found in the, in, in the verse 14 of Revelation 9. To... So when the 150 years ended, the Turks were loosed, and the independence of the Greeks ceased by the voluntarily um, acknowledging that they only existed politically by the permission of the Turkish Sultan. So Emperor, Bez the Byzantine Emperor Constantine is crowned in history. That's found in History of, that's found in the web um, secular website, historyof.com. So in 1499, exactly 150 years, this, this um, empire lost their independence for a while. So now we see the first war. That was that, that happened. So exactly what the Bible says, 150 years later, exactly the time what the Bible says, this happens. So let's go to the. So now, what happened next? How many how many years do we have left? Anybody remember? 391. When Harry shot, 391 and what 15 days. So now from 1499, we supposed to have 391 and 15 days left. So what happened after that? We see here, Abdul Mesut the first yields the Ottoman independence in international affairs. So it gave out the power that it lost, finally, its independence in an international affair. Exactly August 11th, 1840, AD. Exactly the 15 days that it talked about, 491 and 15 days exactly later, this happened. Let's go to the next. It says there, in the year 1840, and then a remarkable fulfillment of the prophecy excited wide interest. Two years before Josiah Leach, one of the leading ministers preaching the second advent published the exposition of Revelation 9. So now this man put this out. He put on the time prophecy, all the things, and he published it. And he said, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and specify not only the year, but the very day on which this would take place. According to this explanation, which was purely a matter of calculation on the prophetic periods of the scripture. So this man predicted the exact day 
And this, it says, was a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy which ex excited wide interest. The reason why I'm showing you this here is that this man was saying, because what was William Miller doing? He has written a prophecy, he has given a time when God will come again, when Christ will come again. And now, one of the men who worked with William Miller is saying that Ottoman Empire will fall in 1844, exactly the day that he said it fell. And people were watching him saying, wow, there is something about this Bible. Because if this man can tell me the exact day, the exact year that I pass was for, this movement must be led by God. So now we see how thousands of people started following the Advent movement when they saw this. This gave even more power to what William Miller was trying to preach in his message. So he says that the prediction was widely published and thousands watched the course of events with eager interest. So now, the London Morning says, We the Allies have conquered Saint Jean d'Arc. We have dissipated into the into thin air the prestige that till lately invested us with a other name of Muhammad Ali. So now we see here that the, the publications, the newspapers, show the, the the fall of this empire. It says at the very time specified, Turkey through ambassadors accepted the protection of Allied powers in Europe. So the exact time it happened. Okay now, so now we're gonna to get to the, the meat of the presentation. So now we see here what we saw before, which which um, empire fell? The Ottoman Empire fell. And who was the one who was preaching this? Josiah Lich. Josiah Lich. Everybody heard today so far? Everybody's awake? Yeah. Yes, sir. If you're awake, say, if you're awake, say amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So now we see here that Josiah Lich posted and he published that the empire would fall in 1840 and it happened exactly. And thousands of people were seeing this and they said, wow, this message is something. And now we have another man by the name of William Miller who, 10 years, he, have, he kept the message and he didn't preach it, as my sister said here. That he was afraid that he would lead people into error. So now it's here. It was only at the solicitation of his brethren, whose words he heard the call of God, that William Miller consented to present his views in public. So now he finally he said, Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this in public. He was now 50 years of age, 50 years old. He was unaccustomed to public speaking. He was just like me. Not unaccustomed to public speaking. And he, was, he was 50 years old. He was afraid. And now he finally said, you know what? I need to preach this message. I need to tell people that God is going to be coming in 1844. So he says that the first of his labor will bless in a remarkable manner for the salvation of souls. His first lectures were followed by religious awakenings. People were awakening in which 30 entire families with the exception of two persons, were converted. So 30 families was hearing this man's message and saying, you know what, what this man is saying makes sense. This man is preaching that Jesus will come in 1844 and they are accepting it. But let's go to see. Let's go see what message this man is preaching. Everybody, if everybody can say amen. I know we have a lot of discussion. You hear me say amen? Yes. The people at the back, the young people at the back, you hear me say amen? Amen. Okay. Alright, so now we say here, anyone know the Fringe's message? No. You know what the Fringe's message is? You guys know what it is, right? Somewhere? You know one time you see something in the church over there and you hear something, something like that, right? Or you read somewhere about the Fringe's message? Alright, so let's go, let's go to see what the first angel message is. We're going to break down the first. Now it says that this is the message that we need to know as what we will just before Christ come. Do you guys want to know this message? Yeah. The first angel message. Yeah. The free angel message, we need to know this before Christ come. Because this is what's going to save us from everything that's going to happen upon this world. A lot is about to happen to God's people. And we need to know these messages. And today I'm going to show you the first part of this message, the first angel message. You guys ready? You guys want to know it? You guys ready, right? Say amen. Amen. Okay. So now it says, and I saw another angel. What did I say in the beginning? That revelation was written in what? In symbols. 
So now it says, and I saw that an angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the what? The everlasting gospel. What did Matthew, two, what did Matthew say in Matthew 28? He said, and this gospel shall go throughout the whole world, right? And to preach unto all nations. Now this is the gospel, the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and son, and people. And it says, sing for a lot of boys, fair God. All right, let me ask a question. What is, anybody know what it means to fear God? What do you mean to God? To be afraid of him. Yeah. To be afraid of him. Anybody here? Proverbs, Proverbs 8, verse 15. Oh, yeah, well, that was good, right there. Proverbs 8, 15. Everybody tell me please, Proverbs 8, 15. Uh, what? Proverbs 8, 15. Yeah, Proverbs 8, 15. Proverbs 8, 15. Proverbs 8, 15. What do you have to say, man? Amen. Amen. I'm asking, what does it mean to spare God? And whoever have it, read it. Whoever has it, I've read to make sure you let us know what you do. And the matter is the way. So, go ahead. Um, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride, arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. So, so now we're here. The fear of the Lord is to what? Is to hate evil. evil. So what is it to fear God? To hate evil. Do you, do you guys fear God today? Do you guys hate evil? That's not enough. That's not enough for you guys. That's not enough evidence for fear God. Let's go to Proverbs 14, 16. Turn it into Proverbs 14, verse 16. And let's see what fair God means. 14, verse 16. And my sister will have a hand up. You can go ahead and... What do you have to say, man? Amen. Amen. Okay, go ahead. A wise man fears and the person of evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. So a wise man fears and what? And departs from evil. So a wise man fears and departs from evil. So a wise man fears and departs from evil. What does it mean to fear God? To hate evil and to depart from evil. Do we see that here today? So now we say that the angel is saying for a loud voice. The angel is saying for a loud voice. Depart from evil. Right? If you have to do it, like it says here, Exodus 18:21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, even men, such as what? Yeah. Such as fair God. And listen, listen to those that fair God. Men of truth. Are we men of truth today? Yeah. Women of truth. Men and women of truth. Do we love truth? We love truth today. You guys love truth? Yeah. Yeah. So he says there, uh, such as fair God, men of truth, hating perviciousness, and pay such over them to be rulers of thousands. So now God said that, okay, my, the people that are fair God are those that are men of truth. So, so now we see here, and the angel said with a loud voice, fair God, depart from evil, hate evil, be men of truth. Why? And give glory to him. What does it mean to give glory to your person? What does it mean to give glory to God? Anybody know what it means to give glory to God? Praise him. To praise him. To preach his word. His, my sister said it's your own. My sister that uh, Bible said right there. It's character. It's not only we have to preach his word. Not only as we praise him, but we must have his character. And let's see if the Bible talks about this. In Exodus, in Exodus 23, 18, 23, 18. And those who don't have it, you can also look in the screen. Go ahead, everybody, sister. Um, and he said, Okay, so now we see here, he 
says, I beseech you. Moses is telling God. This is Moses speaking. He's telling God, I beseech you. Show me thy glory. What are we looking for? We are looking for what's God's glory. So now Moses is asking the same question we're trying to find out. You want to find out what's God's glory? Moses said, show me thy glory. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. Exodus chapter 34, verse 5 and 6. Tell me that. Exodus 34, 5 and 6. And when you have it, say amen. It's just so close. So now we see here. Okay, now God passed before him. God proclaimed his name before them. And he said, The Lord, the Lord, merciful. If I say somebody is merciful, you forgive him, you abandon in truth. If I'm saying all these things, what am I describing? Of somebody. The character, right? So now let's go to the next. Let's go to the next. So let's, let's see this. And it says, let, let's go back again. Let's go, go back. Okay, now it says there, it says there, and the Lord proclaimed the name. So he said, he proclaimed the name of the Lord. So now one thing we have to notice, that the God, God's goodness, his glory, and his name is all connected in one. So his, good, his glory is connected to his name. His glory is connected to what? His name. His glory is connected to what? His name. I'm not hearing anybody. His glory is connected to what? His name. So God's glory is connected to his name. So now let's... Now let's see here, 1 Samuel 25 verse 25, chapter 25 verse 25, it says, Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belia, even neighbor, for as his name, so is he. So we see that, right? We see that as his name is, so is he. What does he mean by so is he? Same as his character. Let's see what the name Nabal means. The name Nabal means stupid, wicked, foolish man, a foolish woman, or vile person. Anybody know what was Nabal or what he did? Okay, in the story of David, when when David was when David was fleeing from Saul, king, because Saul was after David's life to kill him, the king of that time, because he was jealous of, of David. And then when he, when he went out, Saul flee into the mountains. And then he came to this place by the, where Nabal was living. And David was protecting Nabal's sheep while he was fleeing from Saul, from any harm, any danger. So now David went out and he told his messengers, go to Nabal and tell him, give me something so that I might, I might eat, give me some food and give me something so that I might live because of the good I've done towards you. Because I've protected your ship, can you please give me something? So they didn't ask me something good, right? But Nabal said, no, I will not give you nothing because I need your help. You know, you won't do anything, you won't help me. Who's, let's say, who is David? Who is David that I should give unto him? So now this man here is stupid, wicked, foolish, and a vile person. So now we see here that as his name was, so was he. So was his character. So now it says that God proclaimed his name. God proclaimed his character. God proclaimed his what? Character. His character. So God was proclaiming his character before his people. And then we'll see that as my sister did read. And it says, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord God merciful gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. The Lord was describing his character. The Lord said, I am a forgiving person, I am long-suffering, I am gracious, I am abundant in goodness and in truth. So now, let's go to the next slide. Also, where we can see at the, the next verse in that same chapter, it says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, and transgression for sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, and to the third and to the fourth generation. Does it sound familiar? Yeah. This word in there. Let's go to the next slide. We see it in the second commandment. The same thing what God proclaimed before them when he said, show me, my, show me thy glory. God proclaimed his name, and at the end, he was actually reciting exactly what he put into his commandments. So now we can say here that God's character can be also seen in his commandments. Because it says to not kill. Does what kill? 
And he says, do not steal, do not commit adultery. God doesn't, God doesn't do all these things. But we see here that, um, that God, his character can be found in his law also. And if he mentions one of his commandments, the Bible says in James 2 verse 10, you guys are still with me, right? If you still with me, say amen. amen. So now in James 2 verse 10, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So the Bible says, if you keep the whole law, if you keep nine commandments and you break just one commandment, you, it's like if you break all the commandments of God. That's why when people break the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath day, if they keep all, they cannot be killed. Not murder, they cannot steal, they cannot commit adultery, they can obey the parents, they can do all these things. But if they break, if they offend in one point, they break the whole law of God. So if that this is the same principle, that if God mentions one of his commandments, isn't he mentioned in all of his commandments also? Okay, so now we see here that God's character can also be found in his law. So now we are supposed to be obedient to God's character, God's law, and that way we can reflect God's character, and that way we can give glory to Him. So giving glory to Him is reflecting God's character. Giving glory is doing what? Do, giving, God, giving God's glory is, is what? I'm not hearing everybody. Giving God's glory is reflecting God's character. Giving God's glory is what? Reflecting God's character. Let's go to the next slide. And it says there, and I saw that an angel find the midst of the heaven. It says, Say for loud voice, fear God, depart from evil, hate evil, be men of truth. And it says, and give glory to you. Reflect his character. Why must we do this? Because the hour of his judgment is come. We see that, right? The hour of God's judgment is come, so we have to reflect his character and we have to depart from evil. This is what William Miller is preaching. William Miller is saying, in 1844, Jesus will come. And now, we have to reflect God's character. We have to depart from evil. We have to be obedient to God because God is coming in the year 1844. So he was preaching the first angel's message. But what is the hour of judgment? Anybody know? Anybody know about the Old Testament? What happened at the Day of Atonement? Anybody know about the sanctuary? Let's go. And, let's see. So now we see here in First Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So now it's the Bible is saying that everything in the Old Testament is written for an example. An example means an analogy. You guys know the analogy, right? Yeah. Okay, you guys get the smart. And it says it's it's like a model or an imitation or a pattern or a figure or a sample of what's to come or a fashion of something. So everything in the Old Testament was an example of something that was supposed to be fulfilled in the New Testament. We see that, right? Let's look, okay. You, you guys, let's say you guys don't understand. Let, let, let's break it down a little further. Let's go a little further. Let's see what examples we have in the Bible. Now let's, let's, we have two. We need to understand this too. There are two things that we need to understand. We need to understand what, is, what a type means and what anti-type means. So now a type is a figure, is a representation of something to come. We see that, right? It's representing something to come. Like let's say, let's say you have, let's say, um, let's, let's look at a movie. When, when the movie is coming out, let's say a movie is coming out in October, what do they normally have before the movie comes? Preview. We have previews and then we have trailers, right? Yeah. We have a trailer. So we have a trailer of the, of the, of the movie shown on the TV. This would be considered a type. But it's not a real thing. It's not a real movie. But it's like a type. It's like a pattern. It's like a symbol representing the movie or portraying the movie that is supposed to come in what October or whatever, 2013. We see that, right? So this is what a type is. So the type is an event in the Old Testament that foreshadowed another in the New Testament. The trailer pointing to the real movie that's supposed to come out. And the anti-type is the, a person or a thing that is foreshadowed or represented, a type or a symbol. So now, the anti-type is the actual movie itself. Right? You see that, right? So the trailer was a type pointing to the anti-type. So the type is pointing to the anti-type. Just like the things in that are spoken of in the Old Testament is pointing to what was fulfilled or what was supposed to come in the New Testament. Everybody speaking so far? Yeah. yeah. You're, you're sure you understand? Yeah. 
Yeah. You guys are certain that you understand. Okay, we can go ahead. So now we see here, let's look at some examples, just to make it a little clearer. Abraham and Isaac. Anybody know the story of Abraham and Isaac? Yes. Abraham wanted a child, and for, he was like 90 years old, until he got a child, the promise, and then God told him to sacrifice a child to me. And that was representing what? God sacrificing his only son. We see that, right? So Abraham, his only son that he had, God told him to sacrifice a son, to, to lay him on the altar and be sacrificed. And God the Father sent his only son into the world to die for us. So this here, the story of Abraham and Isaac, was a tie pointing to the anti-tie, God the Father sending Jesus, his son, and, and being sacrificed into this world. We, we see that, right? You, you guys with me, right? You guys are paying attention, right? Okay, so now we see here Moses lifting up a serpent. So now the people in the, the people of, of in, in Israel at that time who escaped from Egypt, there was a plague that fell upon them because they were complaining to God all the time. And there was a, a plague that was fallen upon them. And then God said, okay, put a stick and put it like a stick with a serpent on top of it in, in somewhere. And when they look upon it, they will be saved from a plague that was taken. So those that had faith, that when they look upon it, that they will be healed from the plague, they looked upon it and they were healed. And some of them didn't look upon it because they thought, this is foolishness, this is not going to save me. So some of them didn't look upon it. This was pointing to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. And when we look upon Jesus, we are saved by his blood. We see that, right? So now, the story of Moses was a tithe, and Jesus actually been lifted on the cross to die for our sins. So when we look upon him, he's saved. That's the anti type So we have the tithe and the anti type You guys seen it so far, right? Get that sign. So now we have the sacrificial system that God told the people in the sanctuary to bring, some, bring the lambs, right? To bring the lambs to be slain morning and in the evening for their sins. So every single morning, they have to cut the fruit of a lamb. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remission means no forgiveness. Without shedding blood, you cannot be forgiven for your sins. So they have to shed blood so that they can, their sins can be passed on to somebody else. So they shed the blood of the lamb so that they can, their sins can be taken from them and be given to the lamb. So that they will be cleared from their sins. But this hair was pointing to Jesus dying on the cross for us, paying it all for us. Jesus, because even John, when seeing Jesus, he said, Now behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. So Jesus was considered a lamb by John the Baptist. To, to, to sacrifice an animal with uh, well, blood acceptable in the Muslim age? No, because Jesus, and we're going to see that as we go further on, that this was supposed to be stopped because Jesus died on the cross and Jesus paid it all for us. Please. So now, so now, when, when the movie comes out, does the trailer still play? Do they still show the trailer on TV? It wouldn't make sense, right? Because the movie is there. Why would I watch a trailer? I, I need to go watch a movie. Exactly. Amen? Fox over nice. But then, we see here that the sacrificial system was, was taking place in the early times, right? So now, now the, the movie has come. Jesus came in and Jesus died for us. So now the time is done away. The trailer is no longer in effect because the movie is there. This Jesus dying on the cross. The big event has happened. The anti-type of the type has happened. Everybody with me so far. We understand what type and anti-type is, right? Okay, so now we're going to look at an anti-type of what does it mean, the hour of judgment. And then we're going to look at the type and then we're going to look at the anti-type. Because the type will show us what the anti-type is. Or it will give us previews or trailers of what the big movie is all about. So now the hour of judgment. And somebody can read Matthew 25, 8 and 9. Exodus. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. Go ahead. Yeah, you can read And let them make me a sanctuary that I may be well among them. According to all that I after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments 
to make me a, a, a tabernacle, make me a sanctuary, and it says, after the pattern of the tabernacle. You see that here, right? That the type, the type is what? A pattern. The type is a symbol of something that's different. So now the type was a pattern. It's like the trailer now. They say, make me a sanctuary. It's like the trailer. The trailer of the movie. Make me a trailer of the movie according to what the movie is actually about. So now the sanctuary was a replication of a sanctuary that was in heaven. Let's see that in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. And it says, Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand for the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So now we see here that there is a sanctuary, there is a tabernacle in heaven which the Lord pitched and not man. So the sanctuary on earth was a replication. God showed Moses the dimension or the pattern of how to build the sanctuary on earth according to that which was in heaven. Everybody's with me so far, right? Yeah. So now we'll call the earthly sanctuary uh, what? It will be considered what? A type. And then the sanctuary in heaven will be considered what? The anti-type. The sanctuary in earth will be considered what? And the, and the heaven? Okay, so now we see that here. There's a real, there's a sanctuary in heaven, and the one of earth was made after that, it was that which was in heaven by Moses. Let's go to the next slide. So now, so it says there, who served unto the, in Hebrews 8 5, the, the, the sanctuary, talking to the sanctuary, or the sacrificial system that's happening, it says, who served unto the example and a shadow of heavenly things. Remember what he said, right? It's like a trailer. It's like a shadow. It's like a thing that was just giving a, a little glimpse of what's supposed to, what's, what the real thing is. So he said, it served as a shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern which was in heaven, shoot to thee on the mount. So Moses was to make the earthly sanctuary according to the pattern that was in heaven. And now, as we go on, we need to, as we, and as, as we go on, we need to notice, um, we try to find out what is the, the hour of judgment, right? Mm -hmm. So now, during the, the tabernacle, there was, there was different days. There was a sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. But then there was also the, the, the day of atonement, which is the, the judgment, the day of judgment. Let, let's go on. It says there, it says there that the day of atonement, the day of judgment, and the Lord of the day of the day of the Lord, the day of reckoning, the day of redemption, is all the same thing. So now we see that the day of atonement and the day of judgment is like the same thing. So now let's now let's see for us to understand what the movie is talking about because the movie hasn't haven't come yet, right? So for us to see what the movie is about, what do we watch? The trailer. So now let us look at the earthly sanctuary to see, have a glimpse of what, is, what, is, what will actually take place in the heavenly sanctuary. And it says also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement, which is a day of judgment also, because it says in Revelation 14, verse 6, the hour of judgment is come. You see that, right? So now the day of judgment in the, in the Old Testament, it says, it shall be an holy congregation unto you. And what shall we do during that time? Ye shall afflict your souls. So what we need to understand now is what we as a people are supposed to be doing in the hour of judgment. Because the hour of judgment is come not on earth but in, in the heavens above. So now we as a people need to understand what does it mean to afflict our souls. So it says there in Ephesians 16 verse 34. We're going to understand two things. We're going to understand when and why. So when was, this, when, when was the Day of Atonement? And why was the Day of Atonement necessary? So it says, For on that, the, on that day shall a priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you. To what? And the priest shall make an atonement to what? Cleanse you. To cleanse you. That ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So now the Lord had a Day of Atonement 
so that the people can be cleansed from all their what? Sin. From their sins before the Lord. Why did God need to cleanse us from our sins? Why did God need to cleanse us from our sins? That's the only thing that separates us from God. Because sin separates us from God. So now God built a sanctuary to dwell among us. And he couldn't dwell among us until we have, we have been cleansed from our sins. We get that, right? right? So now, if this was a tithe, what about the anti-tithe? Doesn't God need to cleanse us from our sins right now today? Because so that way, you always, you always pray. Lord, Lord, the Holy Spirit, come within me. Or the Holy Spirit is in his place. Or God is in his place. We sing songs like that. But are we cleansed from all our sins? Because if we have any sins, God can dwell among us. So the songs that we are singing, oh, God is in his place. Do we really mean what we're saying? Or do we understand what we're saying? Because if there are any sins, sin found within us, God cannot be dwelling among us. We get that, right? Because sin separates us from God. So now we see here that God saying, okay, I have a special, I, 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 I'm going to set up something for my people. Because I know my people always fall down and goes into sin. So I'm going to have what we call a day of atonement for them, to cleanse them from all their sins. And now, what were the people supposed to do during that time? It says they were supposed to afflict their soul. So we see that there, and this shall be an everlasting statue unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So all the time they had the daily sacrifices. Daily sacrifices represent our prayer to God every single day for God to give me for my sins. But then there was supposed to be once a year the day of atonement to cleanse from all the sins that was all that we committed all throughout the year. And that was like the final, that final uncleansing of that sin for that year. So now, in the spiritual sense, in the anti-typical sense, God is in the we are in the hour of judgment, and God is cleansing us from all our sins. Finally. We see that, right? So it dealt with one more cleansing of sin. It can all the time be prayed to God, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Okay, that's like the daily sacrifices. But the hour of judgment is going on, and then God will cleanse us from all our sins. And we need to understand what we're supposed to be doing during that time, or else we will not be cleansed from our sins. Let's go to the next slide. It says, also, on the tenth day, it says, ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So now, what does it mean to afflict your souls? That word afflict your souls means soul searching, soul examination. Why do we do this? Because in Leviticus 23 verse 29, it says, For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Why must he be cut off from among his people? Because where God is, sin sin cannot dwell. So where God is, sin cannot dwell. And if during the day of atonement or the day of judgment that we do not afflict our soul, we do not have soul searching or self-examination or saying, Lord, where did I, I went wrong? Lord, what are my sins? Lord, take it from me. Being prayerful being, and being diligent in reading God's word, we see here that we will be cut off. So now in the Old Testament, it says that they will be cut off. from. They say that they will be banished from the camp of Israel. And now we are in the, this is the time. Now we are in the anti-typical day of atonement. This is not going to happen every single year, but it will happen. It's going on one. It says the hour of judgment is come. What is, what, what is the word is? What is that? What tense is that? That is present tense. So you're telling me, God is judging us right now. So now, if God is judging us right now, what are we supposed to be doing? Afflicting our souls. And what does it mean to afflict our souls? Soul searching. Soul searching. What else? Self-examination. So now we need to go into our hearts and to search our hearts and say, Lord, what are the sins that I'm holding on to? What are the things that I'm holding on to that might separate me from you? Because if anything is found in us that will separate us from God, we'll be cut off from God. We see that, right? This is a very serious day that we're living in. Did God say to celebrate in that day? No. Did God say to jump and shout for joy? No. no? What did God say? To afflict your souls. So we're in a, we're in a judgment right now, basically. We are in a judgment right now. We're being judged right now. Yes. And now, if we are in judgment right now, we're not supposed to be all celebrating and we're supposed to be afflicting our souls. Soul searching. Because guess what? God is going over our names in the book. Let's go for it. 
It says in Daniel 9.27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. As my sister said here yesterday, that the oblation, the sacrifice, was all that sacrificial system, all of that that was going on, the forgiveness of sin, all of that, it was supposed to cease what in the midst of the week. What happened in the midst of the week? When we saw the presentation yesterday? Just got cut off. When he, when he, when he, um, he confirmed his government for one week, what happened in the midst of the week? He got cut off. He got cut off. And what did that cut off represent? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he caused the sacrifice, the sacrificial system in the earthly sanctuary, it was supposed to stop. So now ask Berman, I asked a question before, do we still need to sacrifice lambs right now? Why don't we sacrifice lambs anymore? It's because Jesus died for us on the cross. And type met anti-type. And now we see here that since the movie came out, we have no need for the trailer anymore. We have no need for the sacrificial system anymore because Jesus had paid it all on the cross for us. So now we see here that the earthly sanctuary was switched over to the heavenly sanctuary. Do we see that? That a trailer was switched over to the movie. Everybody see with me right now. I know there's noise, but everybody's with me. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. amen. So now we see here that no longer should we pay attention to the earthly sanctuary, but now we should pay attention to the heavenly sanctuary. Now we should go out and we should go see we need to go and see what that movie is about. Right? We need to find out what is that movie about. Because now this is the real thing. This trailer is only preparing us for what must to come. So now it says there. In Hebrews 10, 1, for the law having the shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. So now we see here that all of this sacrificial system, or the book of the, the, the book of, of Moses, the law of Moses, all of this was not the real thing or the very image. He says it was not the very image of the things. And never with those sacrifices which were offered year by year, continually make the commons there unto perfect. So with the sacrifices year by year, could never make us perfect. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross for us. You just see with me, right? So now we see here that when he did the sanctuary message about three weeks ago, that the first thing you do when you enter the sanctuary, what do you do? Pray to the Lord, get all your sons cleansed. What, what was the, there was an item, the first item that we that is mentioned when you enter into the altar courts. What is that first thing? The altar of sacrifice. What did they do in the altar of sacrifice? Sacrifice. They sacrifice, that's why they sacrificed the lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sin. So they have to sacrifice the lamb so that they can receive forgiveness of sin. And now we see here that Jesus died on the cross, represented that altar of sacrifice. We see that right? We see that here, right? Yeah. So now Jesus, this was not the very image. The altar, the sacrifice, the altar sacrifice was not the very image or the thing was supposed to come. But Jesus died on the cross. This was the real thing. So now, as I said again, we saw type meant anti-type, that the type was switched over into the anti-type. So now, we're not supposed to take this as the earthly sanctuary anymore. That's, what, that's, the, that's the mistake that William Miller made, that he thought that the earth was a sanctuary. He thought that the earth was a sanctuary, and that Jesus, in the hour of judgment, in 1844, as we point out the prophecies, going directly to 1844, that's what he messed up on. He didn't mess up on any other timeline. He had the time correct. But what he messed up on was if it was earth or if it was heaven. You guys asked a question. I don't know if the person who answered the question yesterday is here. You asked the question yesterday, right? Why was William Miller... Why, what did she ask her? Why did he mess it up? Why did he mess it up? But <laughs> oh, that was... You asked that. Okay, so now we see here that William Miller didn't mess up on the time. That's what we need to understand. Everything that she talked about yesterday, the time prophecy, is correct. It's on point. But the only thing he messed up on was he thought he didn't know that the type, it was switched over to the anti-type. That the earthly sanctuary was ceased, or it was stopped, and it went into the heavenly sanctuary. That God was not supposed to come, and he thought that God was supposed to come and cleanse the earth, and he, he didn't take it for heaven. So was it that he didn't mess up on the time, and he just messed up on the event? Yeah, he messed, yeah. Up, he messed up on, yeah, if it's earth or if it's heaven. So what actually happened in heaven? Huh? Now we're going to go and see what actually happened in heaven. So let's go back. We, we see here in John 1 29. It says, The next day John see Jesus coming unto me, my seer. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is the altar sacrifice represented here. 
So now Jesus, that shows the beginning of the heavenly sanctuary. We see that, right? So now, in heavenly sanctuary, that marked the beginning when Jesus died on the cross. But, and it says, Hebrews 9, 11 and 12, but Christ being come at an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So now, we see here that Jesus Christ has become the high priest. The person who was supposed to make that atonement for us in the earthly sanctuary was the high priest. Aaron was the high priest in the earthly sanctuary. And he was used on behalf of the people to go in and to help them, to, to cleanse them from, them from the sins. So now we see here that who is our high priest now? Jesus Christ himself is our high priest, but not here on earth. But he says, but a greater and more perfect tabernacle, which is in heaven. So Christ is our high priest in heaven, and he's ministering on our behalf. So, when the, when the Roman Catholic seals me, is, that, is, it, yeah. the, is it this type of uh, example that they're using at, uh, at, uh, on, on earth? Uh, which means they use priests to, they use high priests as yeah. they are. Yeah, they use, yeah. Is it, is it that they read about Yeah, they try, yeah, they try to use, they, they, they mess up on all their beliefs. And we see here that no longer are there any high priests making any atonement for anybody. God is in the sanctuary. We can go straight, we can go down on our knees and pray straight, and we can we can pray to God, and we don't have to sacrifice any any lamb or anything like that. We can go down on our knees and pray to God. Praise God for that. And now we see here that God is not God was not only the lamb that was sacrificed, but he was the high, he is now the high priest in heaven. The veil, because we know here that the, the, because the glory of God, the presence of God, man cannot see the presence of God. If we, if right now, if God was to reveal Himself to us, we all die here today. So they had a veil in the temple, so that way man wouldn't see into the holy, the most holy place, because the most holy place was where God's throne was, in the mercy seat. That's where God was Himself. He dwelt, and only the high priest entered inside of there. So just like only Jesus has seen the Father. So the same thing that if that's why the, the angels veil their face like this when, when, when God is there. They veil their face and they shout, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. That's all. They veil their face. Just as human beings as we are here today. If Jesus, if God was to come here today, we all just perish. Because in our sinful bodies we'll never be able to see Jesus. It's just like when Moses came up the mountain. Yes. And God appears on the mountain to speak to him. Yeah. He was not able to see him. Yeah. He was in a cloud. So he always had to heal his the true light or his true his true power. Because as many human beings as we are, we cannot see God in our bodies right now. So there was a veil blocking the the most holy place where Jesus sat on the throne and where his presence was was. So the event that William Williams was talking about, he got it wrong. Instead of him the Holy Place. That's exactly right. Well, she, she was, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Because that's yeah. part of the point. But, yeah. The event that William Miller, Miller was talking about, it wasn't Jesus coming to earth. It wasn't him coming to earth. It was him going from the Holy Place to the most holy place. And that's right. She's 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 absolutely right. Because he thought because the day of judgment, that's when we have to afflict our souls, and that's when the people will be judged. But then he says. But then we have to look at the words that are shown in Revelation 14, verse 6. Because the words that, that we see here, everything, God doesn't put anything in the Bible as, it's nothing is a mistake. Every single word in the Bible, we have to take it with significance. We're going to look at what she said here, we're going to, go, we're going to look at every single word in Revelation 14 to understand why God didn't come in 1844. And now let's see, go back, let's see what happened. And he said, Okay, neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood he entered in once into the whole place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So now God has entered into the heavenly sanctuary. And the earthly sanctuary, that's it. It's done away with. It was a shadow of things to come. Now the real thing is there. Now Jesus has entered into the holy place as the high priest for us. But then what are we talking about? So now and he says, and in Daniel 8, 14. And, and he said unto me, and to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The sanctuary being cleansed represents the day of judgment. 
or the day of atonement. So now, we don't need a saw here, we don't need it. And the two of the three days, God shall, God shall judge his people. And then he sees, but then he, what he missed it on, what he, what he, as I said before, was if you look for heaven, and 1844 marked the judgment. Did the judgment, what happened in 1844? I made a mistake here, but 1844, that's the speech. Let's go to the next slide. He says, Sing with a loud voice, fear God, depart from evil, hate evil, be men of truth, and give glory to him, reflect his character. Right? For the hour of judgment is come. What did he say? It says the hour of judgment. What is an hour? It's like talking about a time period. So it's not saying the judgment is come. It says the hour of judgment is come. So now a time period. Because William Miller mistook, mistake it for just one day. God is going to judge people. But he says the hour, a time period has come. If the word hour here means a season or a time. So God is going to judge his people for a season or for a time. So now the now God wasn't going to just come in 1844 and boom, the judge people not eat in one day. But he said it will be prolonged for a time and for an hour. And now we see here that God is in heaven right now. And he is judging his people. So now, what were what we supposed to do during the, the day of atonement? Afflict our, our souls. So now we are as a, we are as a, as a people. 1844 marked the time when Jesus entered into the most holy place, as my sister said there, and he is judging us right now. He's in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place in heaven sanctuary, not on earth, in the most holy place, and he is judging God's people. And what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be afflicting our souls. Because why? God is going over our names. Let's go further. In Daniel 7, 9 and 10, it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, Jesus talking about her, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair, or his hair like a pure wood, his throne as like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books was opened. So now the judgment has come, the judgment has been set, and the books have been opened. What books have been opened? The books of remembrance. So God is taking notes of every action, every deed that we do on this earth. The angels are sitting here in the presence, marking down everything that we do. Good and evil. And that's why we're supposed to fix our souls, do self-examination, because there are certain things that are inside of us that God doesn't want inside of earth. God says, depart from evil, but there is evil inside of us. And now, all that started in 1844. This started in 1844. 1844 marked the beginning of his judgment, the hour of judgment. The great disappointment. I'm a little bit confused about 1844 now. If we can, a little bit more precise. Okay. Okay, so now, what did William Miller find out? He said, unto 2,300 days, then shall the time to be cleansed. You have a question? So, you said 1844 was the beginning of judgment? Yes. What about everyone before it? Now, now, we need to know that there was the daily sacrifice and there was the day of atonement. So now the people had a daily sacrifice that was taken day by day. So the people, the, the, the day of, the day of um, judgment is the final blotting out of sin. Right now, everything is still marked down. You still, they're in the books, there are still evil right about you, written about you. There are still good written about you. But in the day of judgment, when judgment is finished, God, if you, are, if you remain righteous with God, God is going to erase all the bad things that you have. And when that, when that day of judgment is finished, and you wouldn't be able to remember any of your sins. That's what a day of judgment is. That's what a day of atonement is. God will forgive you from all your sins. Finally, everything will be erased from your memory. They say you will try to think about your sins, but you wouldn't even remember your sins. All right. We're going to try to cut it Okay. Judgment. It starts on earth. Correct? Judgment. We were, we were making, a, we were making an analogy. We are making a type. So the type was on earth. So now here we have the anti-type, which, which began in heaven. So now we see here that by the crucifixion of Jesus, 
the earthly sanctuary was supposed to be ceased, was supposed to stop. So before, before that, they had the daily atonement, um, they had the yearly atonement? Yeah, they had every single year, they had an atonement. Before, 19, before 1844? Not before 1844, before Sorry. Jesus was crucified. Okay. But the daily, I'm talking about the anti-type. The daily sacrifice represents our prayer every single morning. Okay. We say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. That's the daily sacrifice. But then there is the day of atonement, which was the final blotting out of all the sins that you have prayed for in the past. Everything is still recorded. Everything about you is still recorded. And God, in one in, in that day, will finally blot out all the sins. But he may, because that's the sinning time. That's if you're going to be righteous still, if you're going to be holy still, or if you're going to be filthy still. And that, and they say that God will go over our names. They say that judgment is set and the books is open. And God is going over our names. And at any point in time, God can go over our names and say, Is he my servant? And then he'll go over our names and he'll make that final judgment. To whether you be righteous still, or holy still, or filthy still. Like if God free, like okay, if if he like really sincere in asking God for forgiveness, and you ask him for forgiveness, like and he forgives you, when do you ask him? Why is it still written in the You know why it's still written? Because there is a, a theology out there which says one saved, always saved. And God God is not like that. You cannot say, okay, I baptize today and that's it. My sins, I, I'm saved already, I'm going to heaven already. No. You see, like God will forgive you. When you, when you. when you sin, and you say, Lord, forgive me, God is going to forgive you. But if you go back to your sins, if you go back to your wicked place, everything that you have there, God blood is not going to cover that. So you're going you're gonna to have to pay for all the sins that you committed if you don't choose to be righteous with God. But if you remain holy with God, if you keep being a diligent student in the Bible, if you say, Lord, I would rather die than sin against you, when that day comes and he goes over your name and he says, look at this, this is an upright girl. Who on earth is like this girl? And God's going to say, you know what? I'm going to blot out all the sins because she has remained faithful to me. And Matthew, she says sincere. If you're sincere yes. and, and, and repenting yes. uh, 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 to God by saying, God, please forgive me for my sins. Yes. Now, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, it's still there in the book. But really, it's the relationship that we begin with God. That's gonna help you continue the path that you need to continue with. Yes. And, and, and God will cleanse and clean the path away for you so that you can walk to oh. So you could get closer with him. So once you ask him for forgiveness, the choice lies in your hand if you're gonna continue doing that same sin, correct? Yeah. Or, yeah. or if you're gonna keep that sincere heart that you have yeah. when you ask for forgiveness. Because if you look at if you look at David. God says that David was a man after God's own heart. And David did some really bad sins in his life. If you look at David, David was a God after God's own heart. Because David, when he sinned against God, you know what David did? God, David went right back to God and said, Lord, I have failed. I have fallen. And Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. David was sincere. The reason why he was sincere, he not only asked for forgiveness of his sins, but he repented and he left it behind him. He said, he, he not only say, okay, Lord, I will not, Lord, forgive me for my sins, but he said, I will not do them anymore. And he will leave it behind him. That's true repentance. Yes. Saying, Lord, I, I ask for forgiveness, but I, I don't want to do them anymore. And from this day, I will not sin against you. You might fall, you might fall after that. But then when you have in your heart, you say, Lord, I, I, Lord, forgive me, but I do not want to sin against you anymore. That is true repentance. My sister, I want to say. Okay, you didn't really answer my question when I asked this, so I guess I'm Okay, ask it again. Okay. In a different way. Ask it again. <laughs> okay. Um, when Jesus came to die on the cross for us, he eliminated, you know, the need for everyday sacrifices or every time I sin sacrifice, right? That that's the earthly, like the killing of the lamb. Okay. That was that was stopped. So after that, now we can pray to Jesus for asking for your Yes, prayer. that's correct. Okay, so you said 1844 was the beginning of judgment. Mm. What about the people from the the moment that Jesus died, everyone between then and 1844, what happened? They will be judged also. Because when they die, their decisions will be also sealed. Whatever that, 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 that ended their life, and whatever their decisions will, whatever they, whatever their mindset will, they will be judged. It says that judgment begins at the house of God. Judgment begins with God's people first. And God is judging the righteous then first, and then he'll judge the righteous living. Because whatever, like just like somebody say, Parishioner close for you today. 
When you know pastors preaching and they say, you know, this might be your last opportunity to follow God. Probation might close for you today. When they say probation might be closed for you today, it's not actually probation being closed itself. But when you die, that's it. You don't have, that's your choice. Whatever choice that you made if you wanted to follow God or if you wanted to disobey God, that would have been sealed. And then God in that judgment hour would go over all the dead people or whatever the decisions were and God would say, okay, this is my faithful servant. He has been righteous unto me. I will forgive him. Blot out all his sins. And remember it no more. Finally blotted out. And they would not remember it anymore also. That's why the devil told me it's so important that we wouldn't remember our sins. When, when we pray for, for forgiveness towards God, God doesn't hold our sins against us. He forgets them. But sometimes we remember them. And sometimes we look back on our past and say, but I really messed up. Sometimes God has already forgiven us our sins, but we keep bringing it back. We keep bringing it back up. But when that day of attainment comes, we will not remember the sins anymore also. Yeah, I was saying, why God would have to write a name in the books. We got to remember that when Satan accused God, he accused God of being unjust. Yes. So God cannot be the accused and the judge at the same time. So he has to keep a book of remembrance. And also, that when we go to heaven, there's going to be a lot of people. When we get there, there's going to be a lot of people missing. We thought it was going to be in heaven. So that when we go to the book and we view that name, we realize that in the book of remembrance, they did not repent. Or there was a life that we thought they had, they never had. For example, we might see pastors. Yeah. But when they go home, they beat their wives. We don't know that. When we go in the book of remembrance, we're going to see like, wow, I can't believe the pastor was doing that. So it's for our own good that God's going to keep those records. Yes, and he said a very important point, that God, God is a merciful God. God is also God of justice. God has to be a just God because the devil says, look at this, how can you forgive them for their sins? How can you bring them to heaven if they have sins and you wouldn't bring me to heaven? That's what, the, that's what the devil would say. So God has to be just. Because if God will allow a sinner to go into heaven, he also has to bring Satan into heaven. Do you guys want Satan in heaven? No. 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 It's funny how you bring that up. Prayer line, or prayer, use prayer line here. On that Thursday, that was the topic of our repentance. And it shows you how Judah no. repent, but he wasn't sincere with his repentance. Uh, he, repent. yes. he, he repented, not with his heart. Yes. He, had, he, he noticed his regrets. Yeah. He noticed his remorse. But he did not repent to his heart. Yeah. Now we have to be careful on how we repent. Because there are times where we repent. We say, God, please forgive me. But we still have it in our mind what we're going to do next. Okay. So, you know, it, it, it's funny how. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, because also, I, I need to bring up that point. The Spirit of Prophecy said that it always, it always, it always says that. Yeah, it's all, he always says that that they have some men who who pray not who repent not for the sins that they have committed, but for the, the consequences that was placed upon them. That's why they repent. Because because of the consequences that they hold. The children of Israel, oh, they were not permitted to go into the, the, the promised land. So they were repenting because of that, because the promised land was taken away from them, but not because of their sins. And that's where we need to be other people also. We need to repent not only for the consequences of sin, but for the sin itself. I was I was just gonna ask, um, so how do we repent? Like because sometimes honestly, like when I repent, I go back to the same sin. So how do I prevent that from happening? Okay, so now when we repent, what we want to say, we want to ask God for forgiveness. But we want to have the mentality that Lord, I will not sin against you anymore. You might, you might fall after that. But from that point, when you when you ask God for forgiveness, you have to have in your mind. You have to say, Lord, I will not sin against you. I'd rather die than sin. This is where we need to be. You, you say sometimes you, you keep going back to it over and over again. But that moment when you ask for forgiveness, say, Lord, this is it. I repent once and for all when I want to let it go. It doesn't say that you might not fall after that. But from that moment, you know in your heart, you purpose in your heart that you will not sin against God. Just like Daniel purposing his heart that he shall not partake of the, the king's meat. You purpose, you need to purpose in your heart that you will not sin against God anymore. It doesn't mean that you will not sin after that, but you need to, at that moment, you need to have that mentality that, Lord, I will not sin against you again. Well, um, all right, if you do repent, like, with your whole heart, like you just said, right, 
Um, would that sin be erased from the book of remembrance, or would it still be there? God will forgive you for that sin, but then, in the final, the final day of a judgment, the day of atonement, God will do the final blotting out of sins. That's when it will be erased. All of it will be erased. But God will not, the God will not remember it. God will not hold it. God will not say, oh, look at you now, trying to be good now. You remember what you did this day? God is not going to do that. God forgets it. When you, when you ask for forgiveness, God forgets it. But then one more time, but you still remember it. And then it's still in the book, it's still written now. But then on that day of atonement, everything will finally be blotted out. And praise God for that day. Um, and also, like, if you want to have true repentance, also, like, you know, you did something wrong and you ask God for um, forgiveness, and you go back to the same sin, back to the same sin. And, but with me, I like to pray for the Holy Spirit to um, help me with that, to, so I can remember this is I've done, I was going to do in the war. So you have to pray for the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can actually, you know, give you a check saying, don't do this because God don't want you to do this anymore. And that's why I do it. So that's exactly right. And what, how else can we gain victory over sin? The way we can gain victory over sin also, the Bible says, it says, thy words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It says thy words your, your words, this here, where we fall, shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed to the word of God. Thy word have I cleansed, have I hid in my hand that I might not sin against thee. Reading God's word, dwelling upon God's promise, can be a remedy for sin. Dwelling upon God's word can be a, a remedy for what? For sin. So now we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to keep us strong. To be faithful to God, and we need to dwell upon His word. We need to read His word every single morning. Because every single day, the devil throws some new temptations at us. And every single day, we need to get a new portion of that power from God's word to face the devil, to face the fiery darts of the devil. And also, we need to eliminate the things that cause us to sin in our life. We need to cast down the imaginations. We need to take out the movies that lead us into sin. We need to stop playing the video games that lead us to sin. We need to stop looking at those pictures, those girls on Facebook that lead us to sin. We need to stop going to places that lead us to sin. We need to stop looking at the things. We see a girl passing in the street and we keep looking. That's going to lead us. Even know that's going to lead to sin. Do not do it, my brother. Stay away from it. Whatever that, that will lead you away, the music, the entertainment, all these things, we need to eliminate from our life. We know that they are leading us to sin. We know our kids is talking about making love with all this, all this foolishness. Making love with you, making love. What are you making love at 16 years old for? So we need to eliminate those things that draw us away from God. And when we do that, because the, the mind is like a sponge. I'm going to take my brother's question. Heaven, he had to let the, um, the devil in heaven too. But what did the devil do to get kicked out? Okay, so now in Revelation, when we look at Revelation, I think it was verse 4, it says that there was a war, there's a war in heaven. Michael and his angels, what okay? 4. Michael and his angels fought against the, the dragon and his angels. So the devil was saying in heaven that God is just, that God is asking us something to do that we cannot do. God is asking us to be obedient to his commandments, we cannot do that. And God, Jesus, and the devil started telling lies in heaven about God. And he started spreading lies. And he wanted the angels, he said, he wanted to be in charge of heaven. He said, make me rule of heaven because I can do it better. And he said that God cannot do it better. God cannot rule this. God cannot rule heaven. Make me in charge. My ideas are better. And he started telling the angels that. And one third of the angels in heaven believed what he said. That's what we call evil angels or demons as we call them today. And, and they were cast out of heaven because he went to make war. He was speaking against God. He was saying bad things against God. He was telling lies against God. And he was cast out of, of heaven. 
and he was cast onto this earth. And that's why the, the devil came on this earth and he tempted Eve. And that's why we fell into sin today. And now we see here that the devil wants us to go the same place that he's going. He said, the devil, the dragon, that old serpent, knows that he has a short time. And he wants to get everybody that he can to go to hell with him. But I know you guys don't want to go to hell. I know you, want to go, I know you guys want to stand and say, you devil, flee in the name of Jesus. You guys want to say that, right? And the way we can say this is with the word. It is written. That's how Jesus did it. When the devil came and he tempted Jesus, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So this is how we have to tackle the devil. This is how we have to use our sword, as he said in the beginning, to slice the devil in pieces with the word of God. We have to read this word. We have to dwell upon it. And we have to eliminate the things that will distract us. If you know the music you're listening to, it doesn't, make, it doesn't draw you closer to God, take it out. If you know the food that you're eating doesn't draw you closer to God, take it out. Everything, the dress, everything that will distract you from following God or somebody else from following God, take it out of your life. And then we need to dwell upon heavenly things. It says, now this is the, this is the message. Now let's go back to context. This is the message which William, William Miller was preaching. But he, he, didn't, he didn't think that God was opening the books in heaven. He didn't think that the hour of judgment was taking place in heaven. But he thought that God would cleanse the earth. That the earth would be cleansed from sin. And he didn't know that the, the cleansing was supposed to take place in heaven. And it was supposed to continue for a season or a time. And he says there that William Miller is saying God was supposed to come in 1844. And look at what happened. In, in nearly every town, there were squads in some hundreds converted as a result of his preaching. In many places, Protestant churches of nearly all denominations were thrown open to him, and the invitations to labor usually came from the ministers of the several congregations. It was this invariable rule not to labor in any place to which he had not been invited. Yet, he soon found himself unable to comply with the half of the request that was poured in upon him. And he says, many who did not accept his views as to the exact time of the second advent were convinced of the certainty and nearness of Christ's coming and the need of preparation. Some of them didn't believe it, but they say, wait a minute, I believe, the, the way this man is preaching the message, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And they, they still prepared. He said, in some of the large cities, his work pro produced a mass impression. Listen, rum shops closed down, liquor stores abandoned the traffic and turned the shops into meeting rooms. So the liquor stores were closed up and it was sent to churches like this. Converted into churches. And they brought in people to preach the first angel message, to preach the 2,300 day prophecy, to preach about Jesus coming in 1844. It says, and gambling dens were broken up. So all these things were being taken place. Infidels, these, uh, universalists, and the most abandoned profligates were reformed. So all these men, as you talked about, the, the men that believe in deism, that's what um, um, William Miller for a time believed in. All these men were reformed. They were converted on the point of Christianity. And it says there, some of whom are not entered a house or worship of years. They finally came and flocked into the churches. And then we see here, prayer meetings were established by the various denominations in different quarters at almost every hour. Businessmen assembling at midday for prayer and praise. And guess what? Guess what, guys? Why is this important when I'm preaching here to you today? This is just something. This is this is just something that is pointing to something bigger that's supposed to happen. Because it says this angel here is supposed to be preached. This message is supposed to be preached with more power in our time. The same message, but not we're not predicting any time period that Jesus is coming. But we have to pre we have to be preparers of the way for Christ. We have to preach that the hour of judgment is come. And look at what happened when they started preaching this message. That dance, that gummy dance were broken apart. Little swords were turned into places that people who never came to church for years came to church. And this is what we're supposed to be preaching right now. This church was supposed to be filled with people from the road. We had to go out there and, and lick us supposed to be closing down. People were supposed to be getting ready for Christ's coming. Because I'm telling you, from 1844, 
that we were we had all the time. You know when you play in a match and a football match, you have 45 bad. minutes. So 45 bad. minutes. And when that time is up, if you are tied, there is something called overtime. And we are on overtime. And what did the football players do in overtime? They were intensified. They started using all the energy that they have, the last burst of energy to score a goal so that they can win. And we are, as a people are on overtime. And we need to put all our energy, all our power into pushing this message because the, the game is soon about to be over. And the match is already won, but it's not already won in our lives. We have to make sure each and every one of us here today that we need to win that game in our life against the devil. Um, I, I hear what you're saying like every day, like every pastor that I preach, they say, go out and preach the word, go out and preach the word. But the big question is, how do you do that? Like, what do you say? How do you approach them? So now we see here, what message was supposed to go out to go out with? This gospel, right, should be preached to every nation, every, every tongue and kindred and people. We see that, right? And that gospel that is spoken of in Matthew is none other than the free angel's message. This is exactly what I'm talking to you. This message right here is what we really need to be preaching in this time. The free angel's message. And this is why I'm trying to break it down. This is why you guys need to have some pens and papers and take down notes. Because this is something that we're supposed to be preaching. To answer this question, sometimes I would pray. Sometimes I would pray and I would say, God, help me witness to someone today. That their hearts would be open and willing to hear what I have to say. And, and that... Or you can pray and you can ask um, God to show you what you need to do. Or sometimes things just pop up. You can be talking about something at Bible study and you might be at school and somebody might bring up something that is like in close correlation to what you were saying today. And then you can just bring it up just out of anywhere. For instance, I just went, I just went out to go buy something after Sabbath. And these guys were talking about the Bible. And so I started talking to them about the Bible. It's and they were talking about Jake. I'm um, King James Version, and the guy was saying, yeah, my, my dad used to be a pastor. So I used to be in the Bible all the time. I said, oh, yeah, really? So you, can you quote me a scripture? And he was like, nah, that was, that, was, that was a long time ago. I said, hey, you got to go back in. He said, yeah, yeah, I do got to go back in. I said, I said, listen, when 9-11 hit, what did everybody say? Even the atheists said, oh, my God. Everybody went back to God on that day because they thought that that was the end of the world. So in the end, I told them that at the end of the day, it's all about God. So you do have to go back in the scripture. So that's an example that just happened. So praise God, I was able to talk to him. Amen. And you see what they preach about there? What the end of the world? This is what, like, when we get an opportunity to talk to people, we need to tell them about the, the nearness of Christ's coming. We need to tell them, you know what? You don't have to, like, break down, like how I, how I did right here all the time. But what you can do, you can bring out the principles of what I was talking about in the previous messages. The three messages of everything that we can talk about. Jesus died on the cross for us. You see, fair God, give glory to him. The hour of the judgment is come. We can tell them, you know what, my brother? Christ is coming so soon. And Christ, I want to see you in heaven. You know, just little things. And you can break down to them and show them how Christ is coming so soon. And show them what they're supposed to be doing. And invite them to the church of God. So that they can have a remedy also for sin. They can have fellowship with the brethren to help them to be strong against the devil. So now... So he says there was no extravagant excitement. They, they, did not, they did not know banging music. None of that. They did not know puppet shows or acting or anything like that. They did not know extravagant excitement. But an almost universal solemnity on the minds of the people. His work like that of the early reformers tended rather to convince the understanding. Listen to what he convinced. Understanding and arouse the conscience than merely to excite emotions. So now this man didn't come here and go boom, boom, boom off on the piano, like trying to say, oh, they need to do all this to keep the young people active. No, this man came in with the word of God. And people were by the thousands coming to the church. They did not know anything that to drive anybody emotion. He said, mm, that was good. No, any, no, nothing like that. He said, bro, uh, I feel a spirit, right? And you start to stop and feel that they all this foolishness, right? None of that. Just the preaching of the word of God and people were converted. Can you say amen? Amen. And do, do you guys, you, you guys like what I'm, what I'm talking about here today, right? It's a joy to read the Bible, right? 
Did I did I come here and try to sing and all this stuff with you to keep your, to keep your attention? Did I do that? No. I just I just spoke from the word of God. And it says by this hair, it it's what? It rather convinced the conscience, the mind, the decisions that they make rather than the emotions. And this is what we need to cater to. We need to cater to our young people's minds and their conscience rather try to excite them or their emotions. It says, meet it together. Now, this is, this is the part where that is getting a little heated. It says, meet it together with 100,000 others. About 100,000 others, what do you think? Just like 100,000 people at that time, by the preaching of just this man and a few other people, 100,000 people, in just a space, just a short space of time. When did he start preaching? 1833 until 1844. And we see here, 100,000 people and others were expelled from the churches for their beliefs. These believers in the soon advent of Christ came from all denominations and included at least 200 ministers from prominent Protestant churches. So now this is what we call the Advent Movement. The Advent means the coming of Christ. Men who believe in the coming of Christ, we see here that this was the Advent Movement we began. We are the seven-day Adventists. After the Sabbath day, and we believe in the coming of Christ. But they were the Adventists. And we see here that 200 ministers from prominent Protestant churches, they all came together Methodists, Lutherans, Baptists, all of them came together and they believed in the coming of 1844, the coming of Christ. It says, drawing from the parable of the ten virgins, Miller's message became known as the midnight cry, the return of the bridegroom. There was a return to primitive godliness as the various groups of believers awaited the return of the Lord. So now, just like the parable, the ten virgins and Christ, the bridegroom cometh, and he called all the virgins to come to the wedding feast. And Christ and the people were coming. He said, our Lord is coming. The bridegroom is coming. Let us go to meet him. And this is what they believed. And now we have, we're coming to the, the peak of our presentation. It says, and so, on October 22nd, in 1844, many loyal Millerites sold all their worldly possessions. They sold all the goods, they sold their, their cars, they sold their houses, they sold their, all these things, and trekked to the tops of the mountains all over New England. Some were dressed in white ascension robes, and others sat in metal bathtubs, all patiently waiting to be raptured up to heaven at the stroke of midnight, when midnight passed with no rapture occurring, the Millerites were forced to return their wounds in great humiliation. As tongues from all over New England laughed and jeered at the many fools who had fallen for Miller's great folly, after what eventually came to be known as the Great Disappointment, Miller's church rapidly fell apart. And it says, they were breathlessly and joyously expecting the return of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In 1844, all of them went into the hilltops. And they were looking. They were waiting. They were looking at the clouds to see. They were looking to see if there were thunder was streaking across the sky to see uh -huh. Jesus finally come. With joy, the crowds had assembled because of the prophetic claim of an upstate New York farmer and Baptist layman named William Hill. He was certain from his studies of the Bible, that Jesus Christ was going to return on that day. The prophesied return date had arrived. The waiting crowd spread expectantly upward as the hours slipped away from daylight to darkness. October 22nd was coming to an end. Anxiety grew as nightfall was descended. Then the midnight hour tolled, and still Christ had not returned. People became ever more restless through the wee hours of darkness the dejected and stunned crowds meeting at various places, mainly throughout the Northeast United States, began to disperse. When the daylight of October 23rd arrived, it was clear that Christ was not going to return as expected. So there was a disappointment. Hundreds of thousands of people went on the hilltops. Waiting for Christ to come, waiting, looking up at the sky, the eastern sky, at the clouds. Somewhere in the houses, looking to see if this will be fulfilled. And they waited until midnight. And then the sun came up, 
and they were like, Jesus is not going to come anymore. Great disappointment after that day. It says the church fell apart. Many left the church. Many were discouraged and said, this, this was wrong. They said that the prophecies were wrong. And many of them were discouraged and didn't continue in Jesus. Something like that can happen. I don't know if it's the same story you're telling, but while I was at that final, that final, while I was in Haiti, where they talked about in the 1900s, uh, there was uh, someone that says Jesus was there, and you know, there was a whole. I don't know if you ever heard that, uh, and, and it became a big issue. Yeah, they have, so, yeah, they have a lot. They have a, they have a lot of people who predicted the, the coming of Jesus. Of Jesus, and that's yeah. gonna happen. Um, yeah, and that's gonna happen. But then he didn't, some of them, I don't know where they get the revelation from. Some of them say from a dream. Some of them, this, this guy is going to get some, some spirits to himself. But this man predicted the coming of Jesus from the scripture. But just at one point, he messed up on it. But then, we need to ask a question. If the Holy Spirit was leading the, the Holy Spirit was leading William Miller, why did God allow that to happen? If God, if this was God's true church, if God was leading his people, why did this happen? He says, looking back, no further collapse of Christian hope is comparable except the crushing despairs of the disciples. When Jesus was tried and crucified, the same lesson applies. Even as the disciples soon learned that Jesus had not failed in his mission, that he was victorious over sin, so the disappointed Millerites soon learned that Jesus has also not failed them. And now we have this question to ask. If God was in charge, why did this happen? What happened to the movement after the disappointment? How did we, seven Adventists, came about? I hope you all are paying attention because I will be asking a question about that especially. So pay close attention. Uh, I don't know if you all, if this question has been asked to you school, but it has brought up to my attention many times. What is seven languages? What is that? What is our, well, how did it start? And so forth. So please pay close attention, especially with that part. Whoever's talking, this is the talk. Okay, I will be asking questions later on about this. Okay, so now, but my brother saying you, you have to pay attention tomorrow because we'll answer these questions tomorrow in our presentation. You guys, you guys want to come back, right? Yeah. You guys want to know the answers to the question, right? Yeah. Okay, so we make it in a way that you guys can be. You know what? I'm going to come back tomorrow to find out why God allowed this to happen. What, what, how, did, how did we came to be? Um, do we have any questions? You have... I saw somebody raise their hand. What time is it? At 7 30 tomorrow. The same time is that. 7 30 on the dot. Yeah. PM. No, AM. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you guys can be at, at AM tomorrow, that would be good. We're going to stay here also. <laughs> so how did Ellen G. White get involved? How did Ellen G. White get involved? And we'll answer the questions tomorrow. And Mon tomorrow, Sunday night and Monday night. We'll answer all these questions. Let me see now to all those who want to be here tomorrow night. You guys enjoy this, this, this presentation, right? Yeah. I have a lot to share. And is the great disappointment a good thing or a bad thing? We'll find out. Well, we'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> let, 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 me give, let me give you a hint. Let me give you a hint. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. No. No. Okay. Okay. Let's turn to Luke 12, 36. Let's see what my sister here is showing us. Luke 12, 36. You're going in here. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return for the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open up unto him immediately. So now, God didn't leave his people in darkness. God didn't leave his people in disappointment and discouraged, but he showed them what, what actually took place and what was supposed to happen 